In the previous episode, we looked at the German spring offensives of 1918. Germany looked like it was going to break out and perhaps even capture Paris, but then it's pushed back. British are adapting to the realities of World War I. They're using combined arms assault for the first time. They're figuring out how to withdraw, counterattack. American troops are pouring into the Western Front, and things are looking bad for the Germans. But we're going to pause on the Western Front and move to the Eastern Front in 1918 and look at the Battle of Megiddo. Uh, So Megiddo is a place that has seen warfare many times before. Uh, One of the first instances is in the 15th century, not AD, but BC. Uh, This is a battle between ancient Egyptians led by Pharaoh Thutmose III and a Canaanite coalition. Uh, What's interesting is that this is the first battle to have been recorded in what we accept as a relatively reliable detail uh, due to ancient sources we have there. Uh, Then there's another battle of Megiddo in the 6th century, again, not AD, but BC, between Egypt and Judea. This is uh, accounted in the Old Testament in uh, also the writings of Josephus between um, Pharaoh Necho II. Um, he's going to fight the fading Neo-Assyrian Empire, and this requires passing through territory controlled by the kingdom of Judah. And um, in the Old Testament, it recounts that the Judean king Josiah refuses to let the Egyptians pass, and then the forces battle the Egyptians at Megiddo, resulting in Josiah's death and Judea becoming a vassal state of Egypt. And if you really want to uh, stress the importance of Megiddo, this valley, according to the book of Revelation in the New Testament, Armageddon is the prophesied location of a gathering of armies for battle during the end times. It's interpreted literally and also symbolically based on different people's eschatology. And Armageddon, the word, is just Greek for Har Megiddo. So uh, important place right there. And the significance of this area is probably not lost on the enemy combatants. Uh, Before James describes what's going on here, uh, I just want to bring in a little bit more Ottoman context because that's what I like to do. Uh, If we remember why the Ottomans originally joined the war in 1914 on the side of the Central Powers, it did so because it wanted to reassert its control over its former territories. Uh, That seems like everyone is getting involved in World War I at the end of the day. But it wanted to do that in their territories in Egypt and the Balkans. Uh, These were some of the richest, most significant territories. The Balkans were the major population centers of the Ottoman Empire. Egypt was the agricultural hub. It had been the breadbasket of the Ottomans ever since it took over it in 1517. Uh, So the Ottomans launched a surprise attack on the Suez Canal on January 26, 1915. Uh, The British forces were able to successfully defend the canal, and then they went on the offensive and crossed into the Sinai Peninsula. The success there led General Sir Archibald Murray to press his advantage by invading Palestine. But two attacks on Ottoman-held Gaza in March and April 1917 failed, and then Murray was replaced by General Sir Edmund Allenby. Allenby was experienced. He had commanded mounted units in the Boer War uh, that lasted from 1899 to 1902, And he believed in mobile warfare, not trench warfare, which you don't really see on the Eastern Front that much anyway. But rather than risk another failure at Gaza, he planned a strategic maneuver to encircle Gaza and drive deep into the desert on a long and arduous ride. So that's a little bit of context of what's happening there. So take us away, James. What else is happening on the Eastern Front in the Ottoman theater? All right. What we're going to do here, uh, that's a Thanks for bringing us up to date on, and re- refreshing everybody's memory on what had been going on in the Far East, or not the Far East, but we would say today the Middle East, Southwest Asia. What I want to do before we go back down into the Middle East is kind of go around the horn and look at what's happening in different parts of the East. So first of all, we'll look at the Caucasus. In the spring of 1918, now remember, by this time, Russia is out. They have essentially surrendered and given up and completely left the war. In the spring of 1918, the Ottomans attacked into the Caucasus. This time, they were successful because they didn't have Russians to stop them. They pushed back Armenians and Georgians, and both the Ottomans and the Germans marched toward the oil fields of Baku. Baku is in modern-day Azerbaijan, a major oil center. Oil was becoming a 
major commodity with due to the increase in the use of motorized vehicles and especially tanks and airplanes. And everybody realized oil was the future. Maybe not everybody, but a lot of people did, people who were forward thinkers. And it's interesting, Scott, that here the Ottomans and the Germans, who were technically on the same side, they were allies, they're competing and, and in some cases literally fighting each other to get to Baku. In the meantime, Georgia and Armenia and Azerbaijan, all of which had been part of Russia, they declared themselves to be independent nations. And Georgia became a German protectorate. By mid-June, German and Ottoman forces were fighting in the Caucasus. The Ottomans had attacked. By mid-June, Ottoman forces were closing in on Baku. And in August, a local force fought them off with British help. But by September, by September 14th, the Ottomans finally captured Baku. Of course, that's going to be a temporary temporary uh, holding of Baku, but for a while they do get to have some of that oil. Now, so that's what's, it's very interesting. It's, we see the central powers are par starting to crack. They're starting to come apart and even fight each other. We'd already seen in a previous episode that the Austrians were going behind Germany's back and trying to make a separate peace with the Western allies. Now the, the Ottomans and the Germans are fighting over oil, basically. All right, now back in Serbia and Bulgaria, um, we had seen in a previous episode that a, a five-nation army had been found uh, created, mainly with British and French forces, but also with some Greeks, Italians, and Serbs. And the Serbs are also starting to flex a little bit of muscle. In August and September, the Serb army pushed the Bulgarians back. Thousands of Bulgarian troops mutinied, and Alexander Stamboliski declared a new republic. Bulgaria requested an armistice on September 29th, and the request was accepted. This is 1918, by the way. We're, we're fully into 1918. The request was accepted, ending Bulgaria's participation in the war. So this is a historic moment. We see the first of the four central powers bailing out. <laughs> Bulgaria says, we're out of here. No more of this. Not surprising since they're also the smallest, and they didn't want to get crushed. So now you're down in the central powers to just Germany, Austria, and the Ottomans. For now, uh, there's going to be some more <laughs> uh, shoes to fall in just a minute. Now, let's talk about Austria and Italy. We'd seen, we've seen throughout the war a long series of essentially inconclusive battles on the Asanzo River, 12 and all. On June 15th, the Austrians attacked the Italians at the Piave River. The Italians had British gas masks and the Allies controlled the air. Still, the Austrians made initial gains, but the Italians drove them back. The Austrians retreated on the 20th. On October, uh, sorry, I can't talk all of a sudden. <laughs> on October 24th, Italian and Allied positions attacked the Austrians at the Piave, beginning the Battle of Vittorio Veneto. I like that name, Vittorio Veneto. Uh, Austrian units mutinied, and the Austrians had to retreat, losing many prisoners. Finally, Austria signed an armistice on November 3rd, and fighting ceased on the 4th. Austria-Hungary was breaking up into smaller nations, and now by this point, I should say, uh, we haven't gotten to this yet. We're going a little out of order, but the Ottomans are also out. So by November 4th, Germany is now all on its own. So we've seen Bulgaria is out. Now, Austria-Hungary is out. In fact, it doesn't even exist anymore. Now let's see what happens with the Ottomans. All right, so background to the Battle of Megiddo, this Battle of Megiddo. And it's, it's, it's cool, Scott, that you brought up the previous battles of Megiddo because when I first started doing research on this battle, of course, the first thing I did was Google Battle of Megiddo. <laughs> it's like, All sorts no, of interesting search results. Yeah, I got the wrong battle twice before I finally found the real one. This is, this is like the third most famous Battle of Megiddo, but, but it's, it's part of an overall campaign that – uh, is, has incredible significance. And the Battle of Megiddo, we're going to see, is basically the straw that breaks the camel's back. It's the end of a long process of Ottoman retreat and allied and Arab advances in the Middle East. All right. You ready? Let's do it. Let's do it. In 1916, as Scott and I mentioned previously, the Arab Revolt had broken out. And the Arab Revolt was led at least partially, it was led par partly by the British, but it was led 
also partly by Hussein bin Ali, who was the Sharif of Mecca, or the he was the Ottoman ruler of the city of Mecca, very important to Islam. The revolt soon spread northward, thanks in part to the leadership of Hussein's son, the Emir Faisal, and British officer T.E. Lawrence, the famous Lawrence of Arabia. Someone should make a movie about him. That'd be fun to watch. What a, why, why, why didn't somebody think of that? That would be amazing, yes. Um, Lawrence is a fascinating figure. We could do a whole episode on him. We won't, we promise people, but Lawrence was very much into self aggrandizement. You know, he was very much uh, an exaggerator and, and about his events, uh, the things he did, his accomplishments, and, and he blew them out of proportion big time and became very famous as a result. But one thing he did do was he led a force of Bedouin tribesmen who captured the key port of Aqaba in July 1917, and this allowed the British to easily supply the forces of Faisal, their Arab ally. On, first, on 1 and 2 November, the British commander Edmund Allenby led an attack that captured Gaza. Finally, Scott talked about the previous failed attacks, but they didn't have Allenby, did they? No. <laughs> Allenby was a much, much better general than his predecessors. He captured Gaza in December. He captured Jerusalem, and British forces celebrated Christmas in Jerusalem in the year 1917, a very symbolic victory there. And then after a pause of several weeks due to weather and the need to restore communication lines, Allenby and his army continued the campaign, and in uh, February of 1918, they captured the city of Jericho. If I remember correctly, Scott, they marched around the wall seven times and blew trumpets, <laughs> and they just fell down. That's what the oh, Crusaders wait. did. They tried that in the First Crusade, literally. Yeah. Um, uh, walls didn't fall down, but hey, if you're going to be in Jerusalem, you can't not go for symbolism. Come on. Or absolutely. Jericho or anywhere in the Holy Land. <laughs> so anyway, just kidding, listeners. They, they, they just laid siege to it and they surrendered. But I don't think the walls came a tumbling down this time. Anyway, so uh, after the Germans began their spring 1918 offensives, which we talked about in last episode, General Allenby was actually ordered to send about 60,000 men to the Western Front. He wasn't happy about that. Uh, It's like, wait a minute, I'm just getting going. Things are rolling. and You want me to give up 60,000 men? Yes. Okay. Uh, From March through May of 1918, Allenby made two attacks across the Jordan River, establishing two bridgeheads north of the Dead Sea. Uh, We're not sure if he actually floated on the Dead Sea or not in his spare time, but needless to say, the British are taking more and more ground uh, in and around the Jordan River and the Dead Sea. All right, so moving on to the summer of 1918, did you want to add anything before I continue? No, let's keep going. Okay, so in March of 1918, the overall commander of the Turkish forces, Eric von Falkenhayn, remember him? (laughs) He... uh, he, he's had a long career. He used to be the chief of staff of the entire German army and the commander uh, during the time of Verdun. He was later, of course, replaced by Hindenburg and Ludendorff as supreme German commander. He was sent out to Romania and he did a good job there, helped conquer Romania. Now he's in Turkey, but he's again fired and replaced by Otto Liman von Sanders, who we've also met before. Von Sanders was the overall commander at Gallipoli and the architect of the Allied defeat. Sanders ordered his army to dig in and not to yield any further ground to the British. That sounds very Hague-esque, doesn't it? (laughs) No more ground. Meanwhile, the British army was brought back to full strength with soldiers from Mesopotamia and the Western Front. Many of the new troops were from India and South Africa. Allenby spent most of the summer organizing and training the army. So by the end of the summer, the total Allied strength was nearly 75,000, with 12,000 cavalry and the rest infantry. Cavalry played a major part in the um, campaigns in the Middle East. And other than a few minor skirmishes, there wasn't much fighting in the summer of 1918. Meanwhile, the Arab Northern Army, under the command of Faisal, was operating east of the Jordan River, and it consisted of about 5,000 men. All right, now that leads us up to the British battle plan for the, which is going to result in the Battle of Megiddo. They're ready to launch a major attack and finally break the Ottoman forces. So, you ready, Scott? All right, let's see let's, the fate of the empire. Let's carve out this turkey. <laughs> <laughs> that, very good. I like that. Good, 
good pun there. Oh, yeah. All right. General Allenby wanted to break through the western end of the battle line. There, the terrain would favor cavalry. At the same time, the Arab army would attack the rail line at Dara. And you're going to have to get a map for this, folks. I can't even do a mental map. <laughs> uh, but anyway, other British at units would attack in the Judean hills and along the coast. Now, Scott, you're going to love this. I love this, too. The, Scott and I both love, like, psychological warfare and spies and, and, and those kind of operations, deception and warfare. The British are going to oper- uh, they're going to undertake a major operation of deception and espionage. They use secrecy and deception to disguise their intentions. Here's what they did. They purposely moved troops in the opposite direction of their planned attack by day and then moved them back by truck at night. So the, the Ottomans thought, oh, look at all these British soldiers are marching in this one direction. They're marching inland and that they didn't notice that they snuck them back by truck at night. It's the old classic thing where you march troops in circles and it seems to the opponent like you've got way more guys than you actually have. They also raised dust clouds. They scattered papers and beef tins to simulate troop movements. And they even established dummy camps and a fake headquarters. The Ottomans, led by the German General Sanders, fell for the ruse. They thought the main attack was coming in the east, not near the coast. Meanwhile, the British enjoyed overwhelming air superiority. That's always nice to have so you can see where your opponent is. And the Turks had about 41,000 soldiers. But because they did not have any idea what the Allied Army's plan was, they had to deploy their forces evenly over the front. They were also demoralized by, des- by desertion, sickness, and shortage of supplies. Yeah, I mean, so, the Ottoman Empire was, I don't even know if a, it was hanging on by a thread at this point. I mean, what's thinner than a thread, a hair? It, um, yeah, maybe. It was in complete. In t- um, Gallipoli was a high water mark, no question, but it is, it is absolutely uh, ramshackle. Yeah, they're falling apart rapidly. That's There's no doubt about that. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. This summer, there's only one place to meet Chuck Norris. Eric Estrada. Friends from Netflix's original Wednesday. Demon Slayers. My Hero Academia. Dragon Ball Z. Adventure Time and more. It's not Austin, not Houston, Dallas, or even San Antonio. It's right here at Bell County Comic Con. Yay! Our biggest star-studded event hits the Bell County Convention Center August 5th and 6th. Artists, superheroes, comic and toy exhibitors, games, cosplayers, celebrities, guest and much more in one safe place bellcountycomiccon.com they were some of the most powerful men who've ever lived they waged war forged peace and altered the fates of billions of people and yet they were just as human just as flawed as you and me they were the presidents of the united states and they are the subjects of the history podcast this american president In each episode of This American President, we explore how flawed men have managed this awesome responsibility. To listen now, go to ParthenonPodcast.com or search This American President on your favorite podcast platform. Once in a generation, a podcast comes along with the power and eloquence to inspire us all. This show will entertain you while you wait for that one. Join two best friends, author and former history teacher John Driver and comedian Johnny W. for hilarious and authentic conversations about life, history, culture, faith, and everything in between. You can listen to Talk About That wherever you find your podcasts or at lifeaudio.com. So let's look at the battle on September 16th. Uh, This is Key Battle 11, by the way, Megiddo. On September 16th, an Arab force under T.E. Lawrence destroyed rail lines around Darak, cutting communication and a supply line that were soon joined by other Arab tribes. Sanders lost contact with Damascus and Constantinople. So uh, here we see Lawrence being the uh, World War I equivalent of Nathan Bedford Forrest, you know, <laughs> going around always raising hell, cutting off communications, destroying supplies, things like that. And over the next two days, other British forces attacked in the hills above the Jordan River, pushing the Turks back. British bombers cut communications between General Sanders and the main Ottoman force. Uh, So we've seen two sources of disruption in their communications. This is very interesting. On the 17th, an Indian sergeant from the British Army deserted to the Ottoman side, and he warned that a big attack was coming on the west side of the lines. 
this is actually the correct. This is not like a, a plant. This guy is an actual deserter. He's telling General Lehman von Sanders what is going to happen. The Allies are going to attack on the west, that is on the coast. Um, Sanders didn't believe him. He said, no, I don't believe you. I guess he thought this deserter was a fake deserter, but in fact, he was a real deserter. Anyway, early on the 19th, the British opened, guess what, everybody? Hmm. Two words. Hmm. An artillery barrage. Take a drink, everyone. There it is. Yeah. Salud. British and Indian infantry then charged up the coast and routed the Turks, whose commander was Jevad Pasha. He fled the scene. <laughs> I'm out of here. Uh, never mind that I'm the commander of this army. I'm gone. Other British units attacked in the east, threatening to envelop the Ottomans. On the 20th, this is September. On the 20th of September, the Allies took Nazareth. Three days later, they took Haifa. In the face of the oncoming Allied onslaught, the Turkish 7th Army commander, Scott's favorite guy, remember yes. this man? Mustafa Kemal, um, known for famous uh, t- attacks with a lot of elan and daring do, but not this time. This time he, he was smart enough to realize the jig was up. He ordered a retreat northward. Prudent, smart man. Ch- Just can't say enough about that Mustafa Kemal. Yeah, he's, he's a survivor. There's no doubt about that. And as the Turkish troops retreated, they were cut to pieces by the Royal Air Force. By this time, the, the British had combined their two air forces into one. That You remember they had a naval force and they had a, uh, an army air force. Now they're just one force, the Royal Air Force. So they're just strafing these guys to death. And it's just, it's, it's just slaughter. Many Ottoman soldiers were killed and the survivors were scattered and leaderless. So the Ottoman army defending against the British and the Arabs in the Middle East almost ceases to exist. Over the next four days, the 4th Cavalry Division and Australian Mounted Division rounded up large numbers of demoralized and disorganized Ottoman troops in the Jezreel Valley. Here's what one author wrote, and I did not even put the name of the author. Duh. Sorry about that, folks. But um, whoever he was, this author wrote this. Allenby's plan for the Battle of Megiddo was... As brilliant in execution as it had been in conception, it had no parallel in France or on any other front, but rather looked forward in principle and even in detail to the Blitzkrieg of 1939. That sounds like John Keegan, doesn't it? Uh, (laughs) It's probably Keegan, but I just forgot to cite my source. But in, in summary, this is a brilliant campaign. This is something we haven't seen a lot of in World War I, have we, Scott? Somebody de- uh, devises a great plan uses deception to help bring it off, and then it actually works. What a concept, right? I mean, Uh, yeah, Alibi, I I give him full credit for the victory, but this is an asymmetrical battle in a way that isn't on the Western Front, where the Ottoman, technically the Ottomans do have an air force um, in the sense that Hungary in the 20th century had a navy, where (laughs) they might have a patrol boat in Lake Balaton, um, but it's not exactly a battleship or an aircraft carrier that the uh, Americans would have in the same way. So um, they lack aerial reconnaissance the way the British do. They lack any means to really threaten air superiority. They have some anti-aircraft guns, but uh, they don't have the resources to be able to power them, to be able to move them. It's um, they're, the, the army is dissolving. As you said, their commanders are fleeing battle. I mean, in a strange way, they're they're leading their troops better by deserting than they are by leading the battle because more troops are deserting than they are fighting. So if you're going to lead, that's the direction that they're going. Um, so not to take away from Allen B, but um, yeah, they're, they're, they're beating up a force that is falling apart at this time. Yes. And just to continue the route, By the 21st, the Allies had captured the town of Nablus, and on the 25th, they captured Amman, which is in modern-day Jordan, and there many Turkish troops surrendered. So that's the Battle of Megiddo. We've got a little bit more, some aftermath. Um, So I'll just go ahead and carry on with that, if if that's okay, Scott. The Allies continued pushing forward. They fought northward to Damascus. And Damascus, that ancient city, a key city, a jewel in the crown of the Ottoman Middle Eastern Empire, it surrendered on 29 September. That's my anniversary, by the way. (laughs) This is much earlier. I haven't been married that long. Uh, 75,000 Ottoman soldiers surrendered in Damascus. 
Then on 26 October, Aleppo fell, and this ended the campaign. So the campaign, which I guess the highlight of it was the Battle of Megiddo, but there were many other, obviously Damascus, Aleppo, many other key cities fell. The British had suffered 53,000, I'm sorry, not 53,000, 5,300 casualties, 5,300. They had about 780 killed, 380 missing, and about 4,000 wounded. Uh, those are very small numbers by World War I standards. The Ottomans lost all their force. They lost their entire army, tens of thousands, except for about 6,000 who escaped. Armistice negotiations then began between Ottoman and British leaders, and this led to the Ottomans leaving the war on October 30th. I just barely touched on that earlier. Uh, October 30th, and then later, of course, Austria leaves on November 4th. The British took Mosul on November 1st, which was in violation of the armistice. You know, there weren't supposed to be any fighting after October 30th, but the British said, eh, just one more, just one more uh, city. We, we, didn't, we didn't get the message. That's right. It got lost in the mail. Yeah. I didn't know that. Um, anyway, Mosul is in modern-day Iraq. And so to sum up, obviously, if you haven't already drawn this conclusion, listeners, the Battle of Megiddo and the actions immediately after it were a total disaster for the Ottomans. They had now permanently lost control over their Middle Eastern possessions, and they'll never have them again. The historian Edward Erickson writes this, quote, The Battle of Megiddo ranks with Ludendorff's black days of the German army in the effect that it had on the consciousness of the Turkish general staff. It was now apparent to all but the most diehard nationalists that the Turks were finished in the war. In spite of the great victories in Armenia and Azerbaijan, Turkey was now in an indefensible condition which could not be remedied with the resources on hand. It was also apparent that the, that the disintegration of the Bulgarian army at Salonika and the dissolution of the Austro-Hungarian army spelled disaster and defeat for the Central Powers. From now until the armistice, the focus of the Turkish strategy would be to retain as much Ottoman territory as possible. All right, so that's it for the Ottomans. And Scott, you're going to give their uh, eulogy here, right? They're, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Funeral oration time. Yeah, this is the end of the Ottomans. And um, I figure it's good to say this now because in the end of this series, we'll talk about what happens to different powers. But we'll we'll lightly touch on it here, but I'll do the most of the heavy lifting now because this is fresh in the listeners' minds. And once we leave the Eastern Front and go back west, by the time we get back to the Ottomans, I think most of us will have forgotten what happened and it'll be hard to connect all the pieces. Yeah, like James said, it's over. And... The Ottomans for the last few decades and really the last few years had been losing the heartland of their empire. They lost the Balkans, the population centers, and where many of the leaders of the empire had come from. Many of them weren't from Anatolia or modern-day Turkey. They were from the Balkans. That's where Mustafa Kemal Ataturk was from the Balkans as well in modern-day Macedonia. They lost their breadbasket of Egypt earlier. Now they lose the entire Arabian Peninsula, modern-day Saudi Arabia, uh, up into um, the Levant with Syria, what's now Israel, Lebanon. And much of what Ottoman ideology came from is that they were the protectors of the holy sites of Islam. Even though they're called Turks by many people, there were many ethnic Arabs under their control, that's all gone. So what is the Ottoman Empire if it's just Anatolia? And after the Mudros armistice on October 30th between the Ottomans and the Allies, they're talking about a final settlement, but under the Sykes-Picot agreement, um, there were plans among the Europeans to give the French southern Anatolia, when the Russians were still involved, they would take a lot of eastern Anatolia, now they're not. The British uh, would take provisional control over Constantinople. The Ottoman Empire would get a pathetic little rump state in parts of Anatolia that would make what was formerly the most powerful empire in the world, or one of the most powerful empires, a little place in uh, a forgotten and a, a section of Anatolia that nobody wanted, about as big as Kansas and Missouri combined together. Uh, and this is the last war that they fight. Um, almost all the imperial resources are gone for the Ottomans. They really can't do anything but accept terms that are dictated to them. The Ottoman forces are supplied with German military equipment and personnel, but they have 
little food and water and clothing. And they, their communication network is gone. Their transportation facilities are nothing. They can't move equipment or men around. Desertions were endemic throughout the war. There's now no army hardly at all to speak of. Uh, so what happens after the war is lost? Um, the political group that led the empire, the Committee of Union and Progress, they resign and the new government's formed. Uh, This new government in Istanbul starts negotiations with the occupying powers for a final agreement. But behind the scenes, there is a dashing commander who leaves Istanbul and leads a resistance against the occupation. I wonder who that could possibly be. Could it possibly be a dashing commander named Mustafa Kemal? Why, yes, listeners, it could be. And in fact, it is. So he forms a coalition, these different military forces that deserted. He forms an army. He fights the Allied occupying forces for three years. And most of these are uh, Greeks, and they're backed by Allied forces. They expect to create a uh, expanded greater Greece that will go into uh, western Anatolia and the modern cities of Izmir, where there were a lot of ethnic Greeks who did, in fact, live there. Uh, but Mustafa Kemal forms uh, a military uh, provisional government, And he eventually leads a successful ceasefire in November 1922 between the warring parties. Eventually, there's an international conference convened in Lausanne. And in July 1923, there's an understanding reach between Turkey, and they actually call themselves Turkey. Uh, That's the official name or the Republic of Turkey, Turkey Cumhuriyet. By then, the Sultanate is abolished by the Ankara government in 1922 and the Entente powers. Uh, the Western powers recognize the new Turkish state and where they withdraw all their forces from Turkey. And in October 1923, a republic is proclaimed in Turkey and a new state emerges from the ashes of the Ottoman Empire. And just to say, uh, so Mustafa Kemal was given the honorific title Ataturk, meaning the father of the Turks. I think I mentioned a little bit about his um, influence in world affairs, but um, I, I... I just, it's hard for me to overstress. And I sound a little bit brainwashed by Turkish nationalism. And I guess I am, listeners. It's hard to live in Turkey and not be. But uh, if you go to Turkish parades or um, ceremonies on Turkish holidays, there are so many Turkish flags that one of my former professors, who's Russian and grew up in the Soviet Union, said, It looks like a military parade in the Soviet era with pictures of Stalin and Lenin, except this is voluntary, listeners. It's incredible. Um, almost every Turkish government building has a picture of Ataturk. Um, what he did was establish a Turkish constitution that declared uh, the former Ottoman Empire to be a secular state. So the caliphate is abolished. Uh, the relationship between church and or uh, mosque and state is clearly separated. Uh, at the high water mark of Turkish nationalism, um, really until the 1950s, it was dictated that the call to prayer for mosques wouldn't be in Arabic, but in Turkish, which if you know about Islam and the centrality that the Arabic language has there, it is mind boggling. It would be like, um, I don't even know by way of comparison in Christianity that there is no comparison. <laughs> it would, well, how about this in, in the Greek Orthodox church that you would have to, let's say a Bulgarian nationalist would say, you have to eliminate all Greek. Everything has to be in Bulgarian now, all of our catechism and prayer. If you can't use the term Theotokos, um, you have to have a Bulgarian term that comes about. It just, it, it scrambled people's minds. Um, the fez, the religious headgear of Ottomans was abolished. Uh, the language, Auditurk has a language commission that says um, the Turkish language can no longer use Arabic characters, but instead has to use Latin characters Um, Now, this wasn't just ideology. Um, There are parts of the Turkish language that aren't expressed as well in the Arabic alphabet. It's sort of like uh, playing a symphony on a harmonica uh, or classical music. I mean, you can recognize the tune, but it just isn't right. Uh, So they do have uh, new alphabets created that can express the sounds and uh, characteristics. And listeners, I've studied both uh, New Turkish and Old Turkish, and Old Turkish is a nightmare to learn what's called Ottoman Turkish. To be a scholar of the Ottoman Empire, you have to learn it. It's um, not just a different alphabet. It's tons and tons of terms, of Arabic terms and Persian terms. It's messy. It's like learning Beowulf English. Uh, Ataturk gives women the right to vote. Uh, Women have the right to vote, I think, in Turkey before they do in America. Um, Well, maybe I have that wrong. 
I'm not sure, but uh, I'm a little a couple. Of, I don't think so because in America it was 19, 1919. Oh, okay, you're right. Close. But there were certain rights um, that uh, Turkish women did have before they had in uh, other places. Uh, the world's first female fighter pilot is a Turk, Sabia Gökçen. There's an airport named after her. He was actually Ataturk's adopted daughter. Uh, man, what else does he do? Uh, there's a secular constitution. Uh, Western dress is enforced, so men stop wearing some more traditional Islamic garb, but they wear suits. Women, too, are heavily discouraged from wearing head coverings. In fact, you couldn't wear an Islamic head covering in Turkey as a female being a Turkish civil servant or even on a university campus really until the 21st century. And this was a way for the current political party in Turkey to reassert the role that uh, Islam has in the public square, and that's a whole debate that's happening in modern Turkey uh, but the military was sort of the guardian of Turkish secularness. Secularism was a religion in Turkey. So until recent generations, um, the role that Islam had was very marginalized to Kemalism, the staunch secularism. And I mean, yeah, you could be a religious Turk, but you to be a, a, a person in high Turkish society uh, throughout the 20th century meant that you would drink wine, drink w- raka, um, you would flaunt fasting during Ramadan. Um, Islam was a very private thing that you did. And if you were a practicing devout Muslim, it was seen as kind of a country bumpkin thing to do. And if you had any intentions on a military career or a political career, you would keep that part of your life quiet. And that's changed a lot in the last couple of decades. Uh, but Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, what can I say? I mean, he led the military effort. He's like a George Washington. He had the ideological impact on Turkey and the legal impact. He's like a Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Culturally, a lot of his sayings and his expressions were popular. He's like a Ben Franklin. There's just no one in American uh, history to compare him to the way he has in Turkish history. So uh, what do you think, James? After this series wraps up, we do a 20-part series on the Turkish War of Independence. Should we? Oh, (laughs) man. (laughs) I'm out. Sorry. (laughs) You'll have to find another co-host, I think, because I just, <laughs> that's not my thing. So anyway, that's um, what I have to say there. But um, well, one last thing I'll mention is, in a way, um, there there were a lot of talks about what would become of the Ottoman Empire after World War One, And Europeans had talked about this for decades. The Eastern question, as they said, well, the Eastern question is resolved. And um, the secularists and the Turkish nationalists, uh, they win in one way. They get a nation to fully express their views. Uh, Balkan nationalists, they win. They get their own independent nation states, although they run into rough waters in the 20th century later on. Uh, Arab nationalists, they win in one sense. They get to have their own independent nation states, although uh, they're still very heavily, uh, their affairs are heavily dictated by Europeans in the decades after World War I. Uh, so that's really how the Eastern question resolves itself. A lot of independence movements and there's different spheres of influence by different Western powers, but um, that's a story there. So that's my take on the Ottomans. Uh, anything else to say about this, James, before we wrap up the Battle of Megiddo? No, I think you've covered it very thoroughly. <laughs> <laughs> now what you say about the Ottomans? Well, the next few episodes, uh, it's a lot of different mop-up efforts, I suppose. Uh, and we're looking at how the Great War resolves itself. So Yeah, we're going to look next time. It will be our last key battle, key battle 12, and that's going to be the uh, the 100 days offensive, the Allies having taken a blow from the Germans but held, held fast. They're going to turn around and go fully on the offensive and push the Germans back, and then we'll see what happens after the war is brought to an end. All right, and we'll see how things come to a conclusion in the next episode. See you then.